All right, let's get this started again. Next up is Ryan Werner. He's the uh, one in charge of the team of dozens of people who take care of recording videos and pushing them up on uh, YouTube pretty much before the talk, almost before the talk uh, started. That's what it feels like. I'm working on it. Um, <laughs> and I think he's going to talk about to us about how this, how he makes this magic happen. Thank you. Cool. Um, so, sorry about me. Um, so, obviously, I'm the guy running the AV team for this conference. I've done lots of other conferences as well, like LCA, PyCon AU, etc. Um, I also run Nexia Video. So, it was founded in 2010 after doing the open source event thing since 2004. So, I've been doing things like LCA, uh, various other conferences around the globe since then. And uh, in Nexia Video is basically, I guess, a, um, a better way of putting that. Um, there are two Next Day videos, which is kind of confusing. There's a Next Day Video Australia and a Next Day Video US. Um, so I run Next Day Video Australia. The Next Day Video US is run by a guy called Carl. Carl uh, works on the uh, event workflow system, which I'll go through soon. Um, but we share workflow and software. Um, pretty much everything we do is open source. And that's one of our um, core commitments is everything we do is open. Um, so the idea is um, anyone else can use it. Um, the reason I do this, I'm really, really passionate about video. Um, so both me doing this stuff, but also teaching other people as well. So it's why I do stuff like this, to get more people out there, putting high quality video on the net, um, which is obviously educational and has you know, wide use. Um, so I've done this talk. Um, lots of people regularly ask me, how do I do video? Or how does a video come out so quickly? Um, this will probably be less detailed than intended. Pro tip, don't run a conference. Also run the AV team and put a proposal in. Yeah. So um, this is probably about a 10, 15 minute talk and then I'll take questions if anyone's got them. Um, also what I'm gonna go through is different for every kind of event. So what I'm gonna go through is what we've done for PyCon. Um, it's roughly the same for things like LCA, so kind of like a three stream to six stream event. Um, a one stream event is different. It's simplified like a 10 stream event or a bigger, budder, bu bigger budget event is um, a different again. So this changes depending on the complexity of the event the size, the budget, all that sort of gear. Um, the reason we get videos out fast is um, I used to do videos manually, and I'll go through the way it normally, normally is done. It used to take three weeks to three months to come out, and no one cares by that point. So getting videos out rapidly means more engagement, more sharing, and more value of the videos, which is obviously important. Um, yep. Um, where are we? Yep, so what we do is kind of weird. So this is what happens when you mix programmers and AV. So the rest of the industry doesn't quite do it like this, um, but I'm noticing the rest of the industry is slowly moving towards what we've been doing, which is interesting, but go figure. Um, that's predominantly because the industry is very vendor focused and we're very open source focused and everything's becoming more and more open source like, I guess, so go figure. Um, so what we do, um, we have highly distributed systems, lots of automation, uh, lots of remote monitoring. So each of these rooms we record, we actually remotely monitor from a central room. And I'll go through that in a minute. Um, but that helps us get better results because uh, we actually view the stuff live rather than viewing it later on. You know, By then it's too late to fix something. Um, we can scout many rooms. So I could tackle a 20 room event, no worries with this system. Um, and it's all about getting consistent and repeatable results with volunteers. Um, a lot of the guys at the back there are volunteers. Um, so we want to have a system that's easy to learn, easy to pick up, and gets good, good quality, repeatable results. Um, what we do now, we started around 2007, 2008. The, the process constantly, we, we have learnings from disasters, and we've had plenty of disasters, oh my god. Um, and we iterate on that every, every time. We take learnings, we improve our components. You know, so every event we do, we try to do something a little bit different, improve something, and make each event a little bit better. Um, Everything we do is open source. We communicate in IRC. We use GitHub to log issues. Again, you guys can, if people are interested, or you want to run AV for your own event, um, please get involved. Um, everything is open. Um, yes. That's all the stuff. Oh, and we use video, we use Linux for everything, which is kind of bizarre for AV stuff, um, but go figure. Um, how the industry normally does it. So typically the way they'll do it is they would have um, cameras recording the SD cards. So your camera up the back there would have an SD card in it. That would get probably popped out every half a day or every session. Um, you would either edit in the videos by hand or you would have a little unit that basically plugs into the podium and it also records to SD cards. So you end up, at the end of the day, you end up basically with uh, audio, audio, video possibly muxed in and another video stream or possibly just slides. And you've got to go back later in Adobe Premiere and basically edit by hand, which takes forever. 
Um, for example, PyCon Australia is four streams, three days. There's about seven or eight talks per stream. So 90, 95 talks, that's about 45 hours worth of video. More will be recorded given breaks and testing, so you might end up with 60 hours worth of video. Editing it by hand generally takes twice as long, so that's 120 hours. So that's two or three people full time for a week or two just sitting there editing videos. Um, and that's if they're on the ball all the time. With a volunteer team, this is why things take three months, right? Because you can't motivate a volunteer after a conference ends for two weeks straight. Things kind of come out and, you know, go figure. Um, it's a big operation, so um, this is why the pro companies charge a ridiculous amount of money, because it is very, very labor intensive, um, or it burns out volunteers. Um, and you, I was going to say, yeah. And the other problem as well is a lot of the standalone devices that record the SD cards, you can't monitor. So if there's an issue with audio or video or something's not working, you don't know until later on. By then, it's too late. Um, or if you, even if you can fix it in post-prod, it's very, very time consuming. Um, we want to avoid manual post-production as much as possible. Um, so the way we do that is we basically mix everything live. So we've got HDMI to USB capture devices. They're taking what's going on here and what's going on there to a US, standard USB uh, webcam protocol. Um, we then live mix it together. So the guys at the back there are basically live mixing between the podium and the camera. That's dynamic, so we could have like four cameras, three podiums. For example, for the, um, for the main plenary hall, we have two cameras and two podiums. Um, we, uh, where are we? Um, lots of pre-event prep. So we kind of avoid having the whole, you know, fix it and post mentality. So we try to get everything right. So we do lots of liaison with the venue, make sure we're lighting sorted, make sure audio sorted, try to avoid issues happening. Issues always happen, but you want to avoid them. Um, things always go wrong. Um, it's about having options and procedures to deal with it. Um, so it becomes time sinks later. And um, beyond live mixing, an automated workflow is key to getting things right. Um, we want to get high quality results, and we want it to be repeatable. So this is kind of the rough setup. Um, each setup differs a little bit. But effectively, um, at the front there, you've got the uh, presenter. The presenter goes into a capture box. The capture box goes out both to a capture machine and to a projector. For a venue, it's a little bit more complicated. Their venue or their projector feed actually goes out to a system that does a bunch of stuff and then goes out to the projector, but same idea. Um, we have another machine there grabbing the HDMI of the camera up the back there. Um, we're then mixing out live into our Victor, Vocto Mix machine, which is misspelt, Vocto Mix. Oh my god. Um, and then we can do things like either save it out to disk or stream it to the internet. We're not streaming this live, um, but the same idea there where it says internet, we've got a little thing there saving the uh, capture the disk. Um, in reality, it looks a bit like this. This was our setup at LCA this year. Bit of a mess, but they're all our encoding machines. Um, things to get right. So if you're recording this yourself, the first is audio, which sounds obvious, but a lot of people worry about this last. They see a camera in a room in a corner and hit record, and you end up getting really bad audio because the, uh, the mic and camera isn't very good, and you pick up lots of ambience in the room. Um, if you get bad audio, no one watches the video unless it's really engaging content. You know, it's too distracting. You can't hear the person. You don't get much, uh, you don't get much out of it. Um, some people argue it's better than nothing. I would argue for the effort put in. Sometimes it's not. Um, so getting audio right is really, really important. And that's just making sure you've got, a, you know, you've got mics and the presenters basically and you're getting a clean audio feed. Um, presenter laptop capture is the next one. Um, some people will basically just edit it in slides afterwards. But given it's a technical event, People don't just use slides. They do live demos. They do all sorts of stuff. So you want to get that context. And again, a camera pointed at a screen, you just you can't see things like small fonts and stuff like that. So you want to get a clean feed of the, uh, the laptop. Um, yeah, some events have a podium computer. So they run around, and I think this, this venue insisted on it. They run around and get everyone's slides on a USB stick and load it onto the podium machine. Doesn't work for us. So this is really important to make sure that can work. Um, and the camera is there. So the camera is important, but it's really for context and to keep the talk interesting. Because just having audio and the slides is not that engaging, but having this, the camera as well helps. Automated workflow is incredibly important. Um, yes, computers are good at repeating things. Um, you don't need this if you're recording a user group. A user group is generally one talk. So you basically can set up a similar setup to what I'm talking about there. But running a script just to save it out and then process it later is totally fine. This is primarily when you're doing things like uh, big conferences. As again, you know, 96 talks or something for this, uh, for this conference. Doing all that stuff by hand eats time. Um, 
This should be obvious to programmers, but weirdly my experience with lots of venues, uh, lots of conferences, is it's not. Lots of people who have done this before attempt to do it by hand. Because you know, it's not hard to encode a video using FFmpeg, it's not hard to create a title slide, it's not hard to upload something to YouTube. But you know, 96 videos, right, it all adds up. Um, and the other problem people make too is they work in a workflow, they haven't got it quite finished, they think, oh, I'll finish it at the event, but things always go wrong at events. You know, we're spending our time running around to rooms solving issues, you know, putting out fire, stuff like that. So you want to make sure this is already way before the event. Um, and yeah, your time will, will be in at the event. So have a computer do the work as much as possible. Um, for the bigger events, um, where are we? Wow, that just flickered. Um, so yeah, for the elements you can't automate completely, you want to make it as simple as possible. So for example, our mixing software, which I'll show you guys soon, um, is pretty straightforward. We've kind of removed all the parts out of it that don't need to be done. Um, there's some quite complicated mixing software out there. This is designed to be really simple, only have the elements in it that make sense for the person running the, uh, running the system. Um, yep, and for bigger events, like some things you can't automate. Like one of the difficulties is audio. Getting audio right in the big venue was actually quite hard. So you want to hire hands for that or have experienced hands, but that's generally bigger events like this. Um, everything else you can automate and we'll automate the audio stuff one day. Um, yep. Um, other part of the workflow as well is things do go wrong um, and you also want to get consistent QA. So you don't just want to take a video, bang it online, who cares? You want to ensure that the person recording the video if they notice an issue can record it and that's marked in the system and the person reviewing the videos and uploading them is aware of those things. Um, and that's another reason why having a programmatic system makes sense because you have a workflow, people follow that, you know, you can't upload the video, for example, the presenter hasn't given permission to upload their video. That's marked in the system, the system prevents you from doing it. Humans make errors, so try to automate that as much as possible. Uh, the components we use for this conference are the following. Um, the Nimato Opsys or HDMI to USB, there are open source and open hardware capture devices. They're the things taking the HDMI feeds from the camera and the presenter's laptop and turning it into a USB stream, which we can then do stuff with. Um, Ansible, we'll use that for deploying laptops. I'll go through that in a minute, but there's a reason for that. Uh, Voctomix, that's a live mixing software. So we use a number of different things over the years, but this is what we're currently using, which is pretty good. Um, that's all, all these elements are generally Python actually. I think anything isn't apart from MLT and FFmpeg and systemd is not Python as far as I'm aware. Um, yep, GStreamer, various ingest scripts, uh, Vayapart, which I'll go through, that's our work workflow automation, which is kind of the magic behind it all. There's MLT and FFmpeg. So MLT is basically, it's a media loving toolkit, I believe it's called. It's a wrapper around FFmpeg and it basically describes how to do things like edits. So if you use an open source um, editing suite, something like Shotcut, Shotcut uses, or even Kino, I believe, uses uh, MLT in the back end. So that describes things like, you know, here's a title slide, here's how to do a fade, he'd take this video, chop it here, stuff like that. So Vapar really tells uh, MLT what to do, what generate an MLT cut list, and then it will go and do its thing. Um, and we use systemd to dynamically start and stop components, which I wasn't a huge fan of systemd middly up until that point, but uh, we do things like our capture box will come up as a, um, a very specific uh, dev device in Linux. So for example, when it's plugged in, it will go, oh, this is here, I'll start my ingest, which is great. Um, and volunteers, of course. We need volunteers to run this thing, or it all falls apart. This is our capture unit. So we use uh, several, but this is the main one we use. This is a Nomato Opsys. Um, so there are two components to this. There's HDMI to USB, which is a firmware and gateware. Firmware being what runs on Get this right, runs on the FX2 chip on that, which I believe is at the bottom, is that right, Joel? You don't even know. <laughs> the bottom one, yeah, cool, awesome. Um, that runs in the bottom and that provides basically the control mechanism for the hardware, um, the gateway rather, and talks back to the machine over USB. And then you've got the gateway which runs on the FPGA, which is basically things doing all the HDMI signaling, signaling can't even speak, my God. Um, and does all that sort of gear. Um, that was developed with Tim Ansel as part of his Tim Videos project. Um, the reason why we created this thing, we were using things called twin packs previously. So we had an older workflow, which is kind of similar, but it was all SD. Using SD in 2017 sucks, right? No one wants that. Um, so we wanted to get a piece of hardware that actually works with HD, and we couldn't actually find anything out there. Um, we found a few very likely pieces of hardware that did capture. But um, either they didn't work well, they weren't very compatible with lots of machines. Um, even you find vendors will change chipsets in their devices and they'll change your Windows drivers on you. And all of a sudden it doesn't work on Linux anymore. Um, so we wanted a basic piece of hardware that we control. Um, and the nice thing about having the, um, the gateware and the software, so the gateware and the firmware separated from the actual target hardware, is if we don't want to make these anymore, we can just target a different device and start using that. Um, which is great. So basically we're effectively future-proofing by using this. Um, 
We also want more intelligence. So for example, um, we want to make the system easier and easier to use. So at the moment, you still need a lot of domain knowledge to kind of do this stuff well, uh, which comes with experience. You do a few events, you know, you fall into the traps, you figure it out. We want, kind of, we want to make this stuff really easy for everyone. So we want a box that basically says, hey, you've plugged this into the wrong spot, or you know, hey, you've set the wrong resolution. You can't really do that with the proprietary hardware out there. And even if you can, it's kind of weird. Um, given this is our device, we can get the information out of it so we know exactly what's going on. Um, and that's the current debug console on the HDMI USB. So we've got lots of useful information out of that. We could talk to that via um, serial. So it boots up. We can do things like the video matrix. So if you look back here again, you'll notice it has several different ports there. It's got uh, four HDMI, one USB, and two display port. Two of the HDMIs are in, two of the HDMIs are out. The display port are either in or out, I believe, and obviously USB. So we can do things like actually route video around. So for the main plenary hall, we have a confidence monitor on stage. So we're using the HDMI to USB. Right. With HDMI to USB, um, our putting back to the venue system and the confidence monitor. And that gives the ability for the person on stage to see what's going on on their laptop. Is this working? Great. Cool. Go. Um, so that shows you. We've got a video matrix, we can actually set the video mode. One of the awesome things about this device here is for years and years and years we had the issue where you'd plug someone's laptop in, the resolution was wrong, you'd muck around with it, you know, all that sort of gear. This gives you one resolution. You get this and that's all. And people's laptops generally just work, which is amazing. Um, so we can basically can set the resolution that everything runs on. Um, we can also debug the input. So for example, let's, let's say we've got a laptop that's like freezing out. We can see exactly what's going on. Uh, which is amazing. I've seen another device that does this, so very, very useful. Um, and obviously the features that we can add to HDMI USB or expand over time. So this is kind of, it's great now, but I mean, it's constantly being developed on or constantly adding new features. So, you know, the sky's the limit, really. Um, Ansible, so we share this with DebConf Video. One of my goals for this stuff is uh, I've been involved in this stuff for about 10 or 11 years in the open source community, and every conference did their own thing which is silly because everyone's reinventing the same wheel. So one of my goals is kind of like more sharing of components. So we're using DebConf Video's Ansible scripts, which is great. Um, so we have lots of machines per room. This room has two machines, four rooms, eight machines. You've got encoding machines. You've got all sorts of stuff. And you want them consistently set up, consistently you know, running. You don't know what versions of things are on what machines. So this basically gives us automation there. Um, Voctomix, so this is the thing that takes in various sources. So it was developed by the Chaos, Co uh, Chaos Computer Club in Germany as a replacement for the Chaos Communicator. I've written that wrong. That's rubbish. Ignore that. It was influenced by GST's, it was influenced by Tim Ansel's GST switch design. Um, so he developed something as part of Tim Videos, which was basically the replacement for um, our old SD solution. Um, it was C. No one really hacked on it. These guys wrote a replacement in Python, and it's way more accessible to people. So this is one of the core reasons we use Python and things, is just getting more hackers to work on this stuff is easier, um, which is great. Um, there's got a decoupled design. So um, DV switch was kind of like the GUI and the daemon was one tool. This is very decoupled. So you've got Vocto GUI, which is your UI that shows you what to mix, what to do, what sources to take in. You've got Vocto Core, which is effectively a daemon that runs in the background, and that takes various sources in and out. So we have ingest scripts. So what they do, they take various in inserts. So um, you know, USB devices, a screen capture, pretty much anything at all. Pass it back into Vocto. Vocto will then let you mix it to choose which, sig uh, which uh, input or output you want. You then can export the stuff. So you can either, we uh, do several things. We save the video as archival quality MPEG-2. Every 30 minutes, we rotate a new file. So we end up with basically chunks of audio, or chunks of video on disk. Um, we can also um, stream the stuff too. So when we streamed the LCA, for example, that was using a different script, which took a different output out of Octo, which then streamed it up to uh, YouTube. Uh, we also take a cut list script, which I'll run through that in a minute. But um, some of our volunteers will basically, when the talk starts and when the talk ends, they'll hit cut. That marks some metadata in a file, which we basically sync off as part of this. Um, yes, I know how to screenshot. Um, so that was from yesterday, so this is Vocto. So you can see on the left there, you have various inputs. So we've got four inputs, camera one, podium right, cam two, podium left. Um, they will appear as uh, available TCP sockets. So you effectively write a uh, GStreamer script or an FFmpeg script to convert it to a particular format, point it to the TCP socket, boom, you've got video. Um, on the right there, we've got a view meter. So by default, it takes in the audio of the first source, so we can see what the levels are like and whether we're getting clipping or whether it's too low and stuff like that. Um, and using Vocto is pretty simple. They're one, two, four. So you want to change that audio or video source, push the button, off you go. 
Um, up the top there, we've got various options like picture in picture, uh, streaming. Uh, I won't get into those, but it's got a few options, as you can see. Um, Vapor, that's kind of the magic behind a lot of what we do. So it's called Video Eyeball Processor and Review, which is a weird name. Um, it's a Django app with a distributed command line app. So it's kind of a bizarre architecture, but it's kind of a distributed design uh, by accident almost. Um, so it workflows the entire process. So um, one of the keys behind this is we uh, use scheduled data to drive the entire system. Um, you've got recordings, you want to do things with recordings. Taking those recordings and turning them into actual videos is a lot of work because you're like, I've got these files, what do they correlate with? So Vapar will basically workflow the entire thing from taking the schedule from the website, passes into usable data, we then can take our recordings, we can go, okay, this is this room at this time, let's associate this talk. We can then do things like, right, we can then do things like um, generate our title slides, automate our encoding, let the volunteer QA it, does it look fine, do I need to re-edit it, are the colors wrong, is the audio bad, stuff like that. We can upload to YouTube using the YouTube API, all that stuff's automatic, including tweeting, um, but it's all around a, a workflow process. Um, and the workers with various steps like encoding, et cetera, run in various machines. It's old school, we use NFS, but we NFS mount a bunch of laptops into a central network, give a gigabit connectivity, and they off they go and they do their stuff. And we use a Postgres database to uh, effectively act as the, uh, the master database for that sort of stuff. So when something goes and gets a job, it will lock in the database, go and do what stuff so no other worker can go and grab the job. Um, starts with the schedule, I've already gone through that. Um, the schedule data is interesting because you'd think things like start time, end time, date, room, talk title are straightforward. Every conference does it differently. This is fun in itself. Um, but we want a single source of truth. Um, the problem with updating our own data is someone, like a talk changes, um, you know, something gets rescheduled, we update a local database, it all gets out of sync very rapidly and you end up uploading a video with the wrong title. So we treat the conference website as kind of the source of truth and we sync from that always. This is really important. It sounds simple, but like this trips us up so much. So getting this right is really key. Um, these are recording sheets. So the volunteers at the back will have these. Um, they, it indicates a start and end. So basically when, um, when the uh, presenter is ready to go, they'll indicate to the uh, person running the room. They'll go, yep, to the AV team, hopefully. They'll mark down, they'll hit T, which cuts in Vogdomix. That adds some metadata to a file, which we'll use later. Um, they then write that time down on a sheet. Talk will go on, questions will go on, clap at the end, cut again. So that's basically two cuts. You'll see at the bottom there that they may start at the cut early. Occasionally you'll start and then there might be like a false start, like you think the person's ready to go and they're actually not. They're notes. We take those and we use those in our automated system. So this is effectively metadata that gets reassociated in Vayapar um, that it tries to figure out from that data what's about right. So you can see the start and end times are approximately correct. Um, so that's good. But occasionally you might have a talk that runs over, runs under, the talk's completely different. All that stuff in that sheet is designed to help with that. So for example, a talk change, you might put X under the title, cross it out and be like, no, it was this talk. And the guys doing the, um, the workflow stuff would be like, okay, cool, this, was, uh, this is different, I need to go and modify this. Um, we, once everything's recorded, we then sync everything over. Um, pretty straightforward stuff. So each room has a directory with a room name, a date and time. Again, pretty old school stuff, but off we go. Um, we then associate the stuff, so we then need to actually look at the, the, the data on disk. We actually need to read that data, uh, pass the metadata associated back to the database. So there's two scripts there, or three, add DV, TSDV. It's DV because it was originally a DV system, it's not DV anymore, DV being an old SD system. Um, we look at the timestamps and then we associate those timestamps with a file or with an episode inside Vapar. Um, that's running the associate DV, so it's just printing out uh, a data structure, it's kind of ugly, but you can see what it's doing. It's going through and looking at that file and associating it with the talk. Um, the guys then will go through um, and they'll use Vapar to basically look at the recording sheets, look at the actual application itself, mark what's in the sheet against the actual data itself, and then flick it off to encode. And I'll run through that in a minute. Yeah, demo time, running out of time. This is Vapar, it is interesting software. Um, I might have skipped one of the slides actually, but so this system, which again workflows our stuff, I've written one, uh, Joel at the back has written one, I know like five or six of people have written them. Um, Carl has written this one, um, we all seem to end up using his. It works really well, its UI is really freaking confusing, but once you know how to drive it, it's great. Um, go figure, so this is, uh, if we go back to clients again, so we've got a whole bunch of conferences there we've done. Again, this is the scheduled data that's synced off the website, PyCon AU 2017. These are all the talks inside the system. Um, 
we can see here the ID, which is inside there, the location name, which room it's in, start and duration state. That's part of the workflow. Everything starts from one that hopefully ends up at 12. We'll go through the various states, um, episode name, et cetera. You can see things like slot. Slot's basically junk data we're getting from the schedule. So the conference schedule has things like morning tea. The way symposium works is it's called a slot. So that's the data we get from the, 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 um, the conference. Um, status grid is super useful. Um, again, most confusing UI ever, but once you know how to drive it, it's actually quite good. Um, so we can see it's our, our grid of basically talks. So uh, each of the four rooms for this conference are there. Each of the days are there. The colors indicate where, um, when we're seeking files over, where we're missing files. So something like red means that we're probably missing files we need. It makes an estimate of the amount of space the uh, recordings use. So this is a really simple UI for us to work out what's going on. Um, the bit's important is at the top there. So we basically have a workflow. So things go through the workflow. So they start off at edit. They go to encode, they go to various states, they end up at done. There's a whole bunch of extra states there which aren't relevant anymore. For example, there's something called Richard. So Richard used to be part of Pi Video. Anyone remember Pi Video? No? Yes? So Pi Video was a, oh, it's still there, um, but a different version of it before. So Pi Video basically aggregates Python Video. So, right. Done. I think we're done. <laughs> Are there still time for questions? Or? OK, I might keep going then. Okay. Yeah, yeah, cheers. 20 minutes goes up bloody quick. Ah, um, so if I go into edit, so these are all the videos that have not been edited yet. Um, one indicates that. For example, we can see some Friday videos, some Saturday videos, and some Sunday videos. If I go into one of the videos, let's see if we've got this here. Brilliant. So that's been recorded. We can actually see the files there. So the middle button there indicates the files that have been asynced over to the machine. So these haven't been processed by the guy in the room doing the processing at the moment. So this is really good to show you. So those recording sheets I showed you before will have a start time and an end time. So we might be like, okay, that started at 13.34 and it ended at 14.03. So we tick those. Um, if we need to um, modify the end and start times, there's a really confusing UI here to do this. So you can basically modify where it cuts and where it starts. That is normally a preview video, but we're not running that for this conference. We can change the state of the video to encode, and then the, it will be in, marked in, that metadata will be marked in the database, and then one of the workers will eventually pick that up and go and run it. And then it's pushed to the next process. So um, push to queue is basically a review process. Post is post to YouTube, but a post to YouTube is a private video. Um, a bunch of stuff there we skip. Um, we then do email the presenter to say, hey, look, your video is here. Um, do you want to review it, yes or no? Um, are you happy with it? Are you not happy with it? That's optional. For this conference, I'll opt to do the email last. So again, this is a configurable workflow. The UI is kind of confusing though. Um, we then, once we review the video and we're doing this internally and saying, yep, we think it's good, we then make it public. So it flicks the YouTube video from being a private video to being a public video. We then tweet it out to say, hey, the video is online. Um, Two Mera is now my email. So I'm now emailing the presenter after we put it online and say, hey, your video is online. Then it's done. Um, and that, again, is completely configurable. So for some conferences, we do more. Some conferences, we do less, depending on the complexity of what we're doing. Um, that's most of it. Cool. Uh, more stuff. We have an FPG that generates uh, title slides. That's just XML, because everyone loves XML. But basically, it, um, there's various things here, like uh, have they even got it on there? No, I don't. Um, oh, there we go. Stuff like that. Um, Presenter name, ID presenter name. So we just basically go through and pull out things like the presenter name and just, just uh, rejects it out and just replace it with uh, the right author. So it's dynamically generated. Um, encoding, so that's FFmpeg and um, MLT going and doing its stuff. So we basically generate a bunch of cut lists from that web interface and it goes and does stuff. Um, we monitor the stuff centrally. So that's Michael who was sitting in room 102 um, looking at all the rooms remotely. Comic Sans a mess in the top left. Um, so we basically, uh, part of what we do here is we live monitor the streams. Um, so we may make sure that uh, you know, audio is correct, um, video is correct, camera placement is good, stuff like that. Um, it generally helps the quality of the videos quite significantly. Um, we use Slack this year. We sometimes use radio, sometimes we use IRC. But you know, all the team are basically chatting to each other. So there's a core crew in 102. There's nothing bad there, don't worry, I don't think. <laughs> Um, and on the right there is our to-do list, so we just use GitHub issues. Again, everything's open, um, so that's all the things we need to get done. Um, but that's how we arrange stuff. Um, that was from LCA. That was a 24-core box doing encoding. Got quite warm. 
Um, that was, uh, we generally do a hack fest, Tim Video's hack fest at every LCA. So we'll spend a week basically working on this stack to get it ready for the LCA, so new bits and pieces. Because we made a mess of the place. Um, and that was Tim and Joel working on uh, the HDMI USB. I think they were debugging an issue earlier this week. Cool. If you're interested in doing this, um, it's not that hard to do, but just do a user event first. So they're much simpler to do. Um, yep. Uh, we're on Tim Videos and Freenode. We're happy to help anyone. Uh, thank you to all these people. All these people are regulars involved with Tim Videos or various projects. You guys are awesome. Thank you. And yep. Year olds of stuff. That's right on time. Thanks, Ryan. Yes, uh, a coffee mug of uh, yeah for our appreciation of doing all this work, giving this talk, 